Um, welcome to the first of our webinars for the Decolonising the Discipline project. Um, as you'll know from the site, um, Decolonising the Discipline is a, a joint initiative between the English Association, um, University English, the Institute of English Studies and the Postcolonial Studies Association. Um, we're very excited uh, about the amount of people who have taken up this opportunity to, to register for the webinar. It bodes very well for the, the rest of the, 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 the series of webinars that we're planning. And um, I'm pleased to welcome you all here. We hope that we, this will stimulate a, a really good discussion, both in the limited time that we have available today, but also beyond that. Um, the, the, we will have um, some plans to generate, generate discussion outside of these webinar forums. The key thing for the whole project is to try and enable us to share ideas and practices. Uh, the Decolonising the Discipline uh, project is based around the understanding that we have an enormous task in front of us. One that at times can feel overwhelming and at other times feels like we are isolated, especially within our own institutional contexts. All of you being here today is a testament to the fact that a lot of work is happening um, all across the sector and that we are all eager to learn from each other. So I'm not going to take up any more time. I'm going to move on to introduce uh, the first of our, um, of our speakers, uh, of our um, presentations. And, uh, this is entitled De uh, Developing a Decolonising Network, a Grassroots Approach, and our speakers will be Arjang Pejman and Surya Simon. Arjang is a third year uh, funded creative critical PhD student at the, in the School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. As a playwright, he has been commissioned and had his work produced at the Royal Court, Soho, and uh, the Birmingham Rep Theatres in the UK, as well as having work translated and produced internationally. His academic interests are post-colonial studies, critical race theory, post-colonial feminism, workplace plays, and neoliberalism. He is on the board of trustees for the Decolonised UEA Society and part of the Decolonising Network and Decolonising HUM, which is the faculty uh, working group at UEA. Uh, Surya Simon is an Associate Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and an international third year st uh, funded student at the uh, School of Literature, Drama, Creative Writing at UEA as well. Her academic interests include Dalit studies and Dalit literature, post-colonial studies, life writing, gender studies, critical race theory and critical theory. She's the President uh, of the Decolonised UEA Society within the Students' Union. And she's also part of the Decolonising Network and Decolonised Home Working Group at UEA. I should say that we're going to keep our questions till all three presentations have, uh, have concluded, at which point if you would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function on, um, uh, by clicking participants and you can raise your hand there, um, or uh, put a question into the chat um, in, in the chat using the chat facility. Okay, Without further ado, I'll hand over to Surya and to Arjang. Thank you. Thank you, Anshu. There's a bit of a development there. I've stepped down as the president now of the Decolonized UEA Society and Arjang has taken it up. So, just very new development. <laughs> I hope you can see the screen. Is that visible? Yes. Okay. Yes, so, yes. so hello everybody, I'm Surya Simon and I go by the pronouns she and her. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Arjun Peshman and I go by the pronouns he, him. Uh, Surya and I are going to talk to you about how we developed a decolonizing network at UEA via a grassroots approach. So the objectives of many decolonizing initiatives at UEA are to expose stories and perspectives that have been neglected or manipulated in favour of Eurocentric ideas and individuals. They attempt to bring to light colonial structures that are deeply embedded in academia and pedagogy. So therefore, decolonizing initiatives are a call for deep structural change rather than superficial gestures of diversity and tokenistic forms of inclusion. Now, during one of our conversations with Anshuman Mondal, he mentioned something extremely resonant, which is that we must take on board the notion that the classroom is a hierarchical space 
and that the university, just like any clustering society, is not a free-floating neutral space. Then how can we cater to decolonial ideas? How can we have other perspectives? Now, this made us reflect on the idea that it's not enough just to decolonize the curriculum, but that we have to explore ways in which we can decolonize the discipline and also the academy and the institution in general. For example, through associate tutor training, through the library and through creating safe social spaces. We were curious to know what other disciplines thought about this and that's when it struck us that we don't have an interdisciplinary forum at the university to discuss decolonizing issues. So the initial aim of the network was to create a space where individuals and collectives from various disciplines can share, understand, discuss and implement best practices towards decolonizing their respective schools, disciplines and in turn the academy. Uh, the network is university wide with a range of schools and disciplines being involved. So, for example, we have literature, drama and creative writing, uh, Dev International Development, HSC Health Sciences, Law and Psychology, but also bodies outside of the schools and faculties, such as the postgraduate researchers and the library. Currently, we have 64 members comprising of 48 staff and 16 PGRs. We wanted to keep it somewhat separate from the SU and decolonise UEA Society and Undergraduates for Decolonising and Diversifying Literature, Drama and Creative Writing Working Group. But it's very much worth mentioning the incredible initiatives. So for example, the Undergraduate Working Group uh, <laughs> helped to organise and run um, a Black Lives Matter webinar along with our own PGR from Decolonise UEA Society just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the event was attended by several hundred students and was for anyone who attended uh, incredibly insightful and very inspirational. This PGR initiated network was developed from grassroots. It wasn't a conscious attempt, it just came about that way. So during the March lockdown, I made a list of all the faculty members and uh, PGRs I was in conversation with as part of my commitment to the Decolonized UEA Society and a few other decolonizing initiatives. And I sent them emails individually asking if they would like to be a part of such an interdisciplinary space. The responses were extremely positive. So I created a bulk email list and sent a message saying that now I've created this university-wide decolonizing network so that we can all be in touch with each other directly. I'm just calling it like this, but we can change it and we can decide the nature of such a network. So the initial establishment was done through a lot of personal networking. I was familiar with their work and they were familiar with my work. And we knew about each other's sincerity to the cause. So there was a whole lot of trust involved. Now, once I sent the message to the bulk email list, a lot of snowballing happened. And people got in touch with me through emails asking if they could be a part of the network. In their emails, they would list out a number of things that they have done and that they plan to do. And I found this sincere desire and passion, not just for such an interdisciplinary space, but to bring about real change. So I wanted to document this. Hence, I created a Google document prior to our first meeting and asked the networkers if they have the time to write a few sentences on what they have done and what they would wish to see be done. Arjang and I have taken a few quotes from that Google document and Arjang will read them out soon. We feel this is important because the network is a collective space and a collective effort. So it is necessary to shine some light on at least a few voices. So one of our colleagues uh, in American studies said that undergrads typically only have three years as their experience of UEA. So while well thought out approaches are crucial to, to sustain an ongoing decolonial <coughs> drive, we need to be better at affecting palpable change more quickly and visibly if we want them to be integral, an integral part of this shift. A colleague from Health Sciences said, I think generating challenging conversations around race and the curriculum is vitally important. And I'd love to be involved in this network to help me through this process. One of our colleagues in Humanity said, I'm keen to share best practice and learn from each other. I don't always get things right. So I would also like to better understand my white fragility complicity so as to use my white privilege more effectively in the movement for change. I think forums for sharing best practice or reading groups and university-wide conferences symposiums will be very helpful. The library is keen to support decolonization initiatives through providing resources and highlighting these, signposting other activities at UEA and providing other practical help where we can. And finally, from psychology, I'm looking for wide ranging discussions and activities, but also critically for practical tools to engage our students. 
And after more than two and a half months of planning and organizing, the first meeting of the network took place on 29 June via Microsoft Teams. So out of a bit more than 60 networkers, approximately 40 networkers attended the meeting. <clears throat> We had no idea how the meeting would go. So there was a lot of anticipation, but a lot of excitement. We had created an agenda to bring a bit of clarity and structure to the meeting. So we had speakers from bio, health sciences, and a few other schools, as you can see, who spoke for five minutes each on what they have done either individually or on a school level and what they are going to do and what they would expect such a network to do. <coughs> The outcome of those presentations and the overall meeting were refreshing and enlightening discussions, and not to mention the awareness of individual and collective efforts towards decolonizing across the university. Now, Arjang and I are third year PhD students, and we mentioned this during the meeting to the network networkers that uh, soon we will not be able to manage and organize the network as actively as we are able to do at the moment. So we'd really appreciate volunteers to lead and manage the network. And we had a few positive responses, which was simply amazing, because that was an anxiety we had if people would come forward to help out. Another thing that we discussed during the meeting was the channel of communication for the network and we decided to set up a team site. A colleague Nadine Zubair then within the next three days set up the team site and organized everything in it. She even uploaded Google documents, Excel sheet, documented emails and even the recording of our first meeting, not only for future reference but also to maintain transparency. <clears throat> now, the next step that we are hoping to discuss during the second meeting of the network is a possible collaboration. If you remember, I mentioned creating a Google document when net networkers came and gave in their thoughts and opinions. Now, from that Google document and from the notes of the first meeting, we looked for similarities and common grounds and we created keywords. So the idea is that networkers can say which keyword or keywords they would like to work on depending on the immediate priorities. So, for example, the keyword voices would look at documenting lived experiences and stories. The keyword discussion would look at creating reading groups or discussion forums etc. Now I'm also part of the Decolonize Synergies initiative which works on a similar interdisciplinary angle but with fewer schools involved such as the University of Sanctuary, School of Education, Development and so on. The Synergies group created sub working groups that would look at different areas. So there is a working group that will look at seminar series, there is one that looks at a manifesto etc. So if you see the concept of the keywords and working groups are similar. So if we can collaborate, then we can avoid a lot of duplication and also get a lot of people working towards the same cause in the single space. Another reason for the collaboration is that, of course, the decolonizing network has a wider range of schools and faculties than synergies. But a lot of people who are part of the synergies is already part of the network. <clears throat> A technical benefit is that Decolonizing Network already has a team site. So we could set up channels within the same site and uh, have working groups function separately under it. And then they could come to the general discussion and chat space for feed feedback and feed forward from everybody in the network. Uh, as Sorry has mentioned, um, you know, that we, we also want to be very aware of, of pitfalls. So uh, our our members wanted to address fears and challenges and a lot of our members and people involved in various decolonizing initiatives have rightly expressed their concerns about the integrity of the network. As most of you will know, there's a great deal of resistance to decolonizing both within and without the university. So we believed it was important to remain a disruptive force while affecting embedded sustainable institutional change. Many have expressed a fear of co-option as we have recognised executive and bureaucratic forces within the institution that are keen to you know, bring us on board in what seems to be no more than a tokenistic box ticking uh, exercise. At the same time, we need to work with the institution and we need to be officially recognised by the academy in order to implement the changes we're suggesting. We also were aware that we need to be, um, we need to be wary of our own unconscious bias. Now, being aware of positionality is key. For example, Surya and I might directly experience just a few areas of oppression through race, class, immigration, gender, but there are others that feel the weight of several forms of oppression. Uh, we need to be conscious of this and make sure that we're not unwittingly upholding other systems of oppression in terms of race, colour, class, ability, physical and learning, gender, sexuality, immigration status, neurodiversity, age and mental health issues. 
We've decided on a slow and steady approach, uh, not because we're lazy, um, but because we don't want to fall into this trap of being tokenistic and making superficial rather than embedded long lasting changes. Uh, as Surya mentioned, we're both third year students and we have a responsibility to our work. So we want to avoid burnout. Fortunately, many, many of the members have come forward uh, and on board offering their help. The slow and steady approach allows us to promote a healthy and understanding space, especially during the COVID crisis. I'm going to use the help of Kimberly Crenshaw here to highlight or underline what Arjang and I believe the network is. If such bottom-up intersectional representation were routinely permitted, employees might accept the possibility that there is more to gain by collectively challenging the hierarchy rather than by each discriminatory individually seeking to protect her source of privilege within the hierarchy. So we believe that the network reflects this bottom-up intersectional representation particularly through its grassroots approach. This has created immense scope, leading to not only individuals' personal and professional development, but an overall enrichment of the academic, pedagogic, and research culture of the universities, and also beyond the universities, because changing the mentality and attitude of people is important and necessary to effect sustainable changes in the society. Now, Arjun and I have- uh, one, one minute, one minute, please. Yeah, we're done. Uh, Arshing and I have put together a few resources here, which we would be happy to share towards the end of the event, uh, just to give you a glimpse into um, uh, the various activities surrounding decolonizing happening in UEA, and specifically in the School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will move on straight away to the next uh, presentation, but please, if you do have questions, um, uh, uh, that you want to put in the chat, you can do so now, and um, our moderators will look uh, look at those um, and try and collate them for when we get to the questions section. Um, so, uh, moving on to the final uh, presentation for this uh, uh, in initial part of the webinar, um, uh, which is entitled "Decolonizing the Curriculum at Brighton University: Students and Staff Working in Partnership." And uh, the presentation will be given by Dr. Vedrana Velikovic, um, who is Principal Lecturer in English Literature at Brighton, and Dr. Vaya Rajapillai, Senior Lecturer uh, in English Language and Media, and also students from the Decolonising the Curriculum uh, uh, group at Brighton. I think Jessica Innes is, is, is here to, to, to speak to. Okay, um, over to you. Vedran, I think you might be on mute. I think, can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Can you hear me well? Yeah. We can. We, can, we can see it, yeah. That's great. I will just start it. Vai? Hello, uh, I'm Vai Rajapalai, so I'm going to start this uh, presentation off. Um, so, actually, we are going to... Ah, bye. We have lost you already. Brighton seems to be worse than Birmingham. Um, Vidrana, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Can you can you move? Uh, to... Yes. Now we can hear you again. Yes. Next slide, please. Yes. Okay, so uh, we started off, um, the University of Brighton had uh, uh, under um, inclusive par partnership or inclusive, inclusive practices uh, partnership. They had a, a project called um, Curriculum Advisors. So this was run by the Centre for Leaning, Learning and Teaching. And um, under this particular project, they, there was a section called the Colonising Curriculum. And, this was the first time they were running this, this was 2018. And uh, I teach world Englishes um, uh, for my undergraduate and postgraduates, actually challenging the idea of what uh, we, might, we might mean by standard English, especially in post-colonial countries and how we look at English in the wider context, the politics, the ideology, uh, and all the aspects that go with learning and teaching language uh, in a, a country other than Britain, America or Australia. So 
one of the so this this discussion or this pr module of mine has been running for 10 years and we have been discussing the decolonizing the curriculum idea within it in different ways by looking at people arguing from different countries how the standard British English doesn't actually reflect or necessarily important to be spoken by Sri Lankan or Indian or uh, Nigerian speaker in order to communicate um, the, and it, it kind of has limitations of not carrying culture with it, culture of the local community. Um, so when we actually, when I saw this curriculum advice project, so I kind of joined that and I, uh, my, one of my students, Holly Weber, uh, said, oh, uh, what can we do with it? So because they were launching it for the first time, they didn't know what exactly that they wanted to do. So we sat around and had a discussion. And one of the things they were interested in doing was to think about creating resources. And one was resources, the other was auditing, auditing uh, curriculum, uh, uh, the reading lists and in courses. And also one of our students also was concerned that uh, there's, uh, there's lots of talk and there's a Black History Month and so on and so forth announced, but you can't find literature in the library that was actually supporting the speakers or the authors that were actually coming to participate in, in the Black History Month uh, event. So, so this was the catalyst actually for us to go into and Holly did a podcast that was our first um, event and a podcast with one of uh, leading professors in English language teaching, Suresh Kanagaraja, and that was one way of building the uh, resource that we wanted to actually uh, be there so that other students and other uh, staff could start to look at ways of thinking about decolonizing the curriculum, giving students a different experience. One an interesting thing that came out of this was Holly was saying that because she had to interview somebody, she had to read up on his thesis or his uh, uh, ideas in much more detail than you would actually do it in, a cl in the class one hour or three hours in a session. So it kind of enabled her to think about it and she's taken this into her master's degree as well. So last, this year, 1920, when we, this, um, I ran into Vedrana and we were talking about, uh, oh, what are we doing about decolonizing the curriculum? And Vedrana said, oh, I'm thinking of doing, having a reading group because my students want to have reading groups. So I'm going to hand it over to Vedrana where she can tell you about that in a bit more detail. Great, thank you, Bai. So I'm, I'm Vedrana. Uh, I have been teaching Black British and post-colonial literature for over 10 years. And I think one of the idea when we set up our, our group at Brighton was in response to um, kind of a wider structural issue uh, or what I think Sarah Ahmed would call a non-performative, meaning the kind of institutional speech act that do not bring about, uh, they don't, do not bring into effect what they name. And I think we, we can all share these experiences of the existing equality and diversity policies within the university, the, the whole discourse around inclusivity and making the curriculum more inclusive. And then we all felt this, this disconnect between the kind of a top-up approach and what we felt from bottom up in terms of our own teaching experience, in terms of the ways in which our courses are organized, how we teach certain subjects within our own disciplines, and, and again, also who teaches them. And then there was a further disconnect by listening to the student experiences of the curriculum. Uh, and I'm going to show you just a couple of examples of, of those experiences, and obviously Rebecca will, will, will tell us a little bit more about that, that later. So this is how our, our, our decolonizing the curriculum group at Brighton was set up. Uh, uh, building on the existing university uh, scheme of, of student curriculum advisors, we wanted to get the students immediately involved in, into this kind of project and, and, and make them as, as partners in terms of changing and shaping the, the curriculum. 
So we set up the group in 2019. And one of the first things that we wanted to do here is to set up a blog where we will have student voices immediately uh, present and also sharing of their own experiences uh, of, of the curriculum. So this is our blog that you can visit. Uh, we also have a Facebook uh, group and we want the students to be the owners of, of this site and, and post um, various um, kind of uh, responses to, to their experience of, or, 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 or a kind of short um, summaries of the project that they have been doing. And I will just show you briefly um, what, what we, we were listening as, as we were trying to set up this group is the student experience of the curriculum that has been predominantly white, tokenistic, Eurocentric. Uh, obviously, Rebecca will tell you more about this, uh, but we also wanted the students to actually write about these stories and, and have them on, on the blog. Um, here are just a few of our, our students. You can, we will obviously share this presentation with you, but these, all of these stories are on our blog at the moment. So you can read more uh, about them um, and I think we also then wanted to benefit uh, from from the the student advisor scheme and and we had several meetings with the students and we asked them what they wanted to do and what they think uh, would bring some kind of a change for what they wanted to see so some of the projects included looking at uh, current reading lists um, one of our students, Hannah Francis, look at one of her current module uh, in the School of Humanities where we all teach and then uh, came up with a kind of an alternative uh, reading list. Um, so this is again, uh, we wanted to do this capacity building but also producing resources that uh, both students and, and staff would be able to, to use. Um, the students also did a, a panel in, in September and again, this was organized by the students. Uh, they also invited the external speaker and uh, presented their work uh, of, over the last year to, to the wider university. So I think our main aim with this project is, is to make it ongoing. We, we have obviously one of the issues is with the transit student body. Most of our students who came on board are, are, are graduates but we already have a student who will be continuing this work. So we, we really want to make this an ongoing project. Uh, we also uh, want to make it a, a, a kind of a, a part of a wider forum uh, where we know that there are pockets uh, in the university where different members of staff are, are doing decolonizing projects, uh, but we want to create that uh, safe and open space for, for discussion and, and networking. But also external networks are very important for us, uh, which is why we are here today. Uh, and most importantly, we want to make sure that this kind of work is, is, is paid work. We were quite lucky uh, to have a supportive head of school and this scheme that enabled the students to get paid for, for, for the decolonizing work that they have been doing. Uh, we also want to also make sure that this doesn't become only the work of POC and ethnic minority students and staff, because we all believe that decolonizing is for everyone. No one has ownership over this. We, we, we should all be involved in this work. But of course, some of the challenges that we are facing um, are similar to what the previous speakers were, were talking about. The kind of the whole question of uh, call option within the institution and also making sure that um, this kind of change doesn't happen at a tokenistic level but that we also make sure that we have an open forum for this discussion because this is an ongoing work so i will pass on to rebecca now uh, who will speak more about her experience and involvement in the project in particular in the panel yeah, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Rebecca. I recently graduated um, in English literature this year, and I'm one of the members of the University of Brighton's Decolonising the Curriculum group. Um, but yeah, it's been great having this opportunity to partner with Regina and Vi and us as students and working together and also having their support as lecturers. Um, as sometimes it can feel like as students, you're kind of on your own in this, I don't know, experience of uni and seeing what could be better. Um, so yeah, so throughout our year, um, our group has been discussing and highlighting issues 
that we've come across in our various humanities um, degrees. And we found that our curriculum content has been or is majoritively centred around European and British narratives, which sees the understanding of Britishness um, as an extension of whiteness um, and as the default and therefore others and excludes other nationalities from the discussion. Um, and yeah, we noticed that in a number of our compulsory modules, um, specifically in our English literature degree, um, which typically combines content on gender and race to one week's worth of study um, amid the other seven weeks um, of the module, which can feel like the course is ticking, you know, the diversity box and saying they're trying to be inclusive when really they're not. And this also can relate to um, the idea of reading this becoming a quick fix for white institutions to jump on the bandwagon of decolonization, but again, can feel very tokenistic. Um, and I felt like this related to um, Kavita Banot's essay um, on Decolonize, Not Diversify, where she states that the concept of diversity only exists if there's an assumed neutral point from which others are diverse. Um, and that neutral point being the straight, um, middle class, white male, um, and the dominant aspect of whiteness. And she further goes on to describe diversity as a new corporatized version of multiculturalism based on management efficiency and box ticking. So I felt that she reminded us that, um, or reminds the reader, that institutions know that diversifying will look good for them and of course um, cause them to make more money. But um, however, us appealing and celebrating this weak attempt to decolonize and diversify does not deeply challenge the system at all but instead dismisses the damaging internal and structural issues that have been present for centuries. Um, so yeah, I feel like we've all touched on the issue of diversity and how it can be just used to just brush off the major issues at hand. Um, but yeah, we've also noticed the importance of the classroom and educational safe space being a safe space for students. Um, as we noticed a lot- Rebecca, well, not a lot, I've got, but, you've got about one minute left. Okay, that's fine, I'll quickly speed up. Um, we noticed a lot of lecturers um, using derogatory terms and language and showing violent um, images. Um, so for example, when we were studying the transatlantic slave trade or the Holocaust without any trigger warning. Um, and so things like that can just be very uncomfortable and distressing for students um, to even bring up and say, this isn't correct. Um, so I think it's things like that, um, like just looking at black trauma, um, just doesn't just isn't i don't know necessary but as there's other ideas such as black revolution black liberation and black joy which continue to remain ignorant to our british curriculum so yeah these issues that i've just um, mentioned um kind of cause us to question what can we do next and that inspired our panel as Madonna mentioned in early september um just to create a broader discussion amongst students and lecturers as we feel like that um partnership is um, vital to move forward um, and yeah to also just be part of this wider movement as we're all here today to discuss so um, yeah that's it really for me. Thank you very much. Um, I must admit uh, Rebecca I do owe you an apology I think I called you Jessica um, by mistake no, um, no, it's okay. and I hate it when people get my name wrong so uh, I do apologize uh, no sincerely. Way. Um, okay, we have some time for questions now, um, and uh, uh, Catherine, I wonder if you've been able to keep track of any in the in the chat or. Um... Sure. So we have um, one um, from Amma, I think. I don't know if you're online, Amma, and want to ask this question yourself. Otherwise, I can put it for you. Um, Yes, I am. Yes, I am right here. And thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. Um, in one of the slides, the first um, panel, they talked about best practices. And I wanted to know what best practices mean. What do we mean by best practices? If you can um, unpack that for me a little bit, that'll be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Amal. Uh, Arjang, is it okay if I take this one, the, the question or I'll just go ahead and take it. Yes, yeah, um, so yeah. Um, when we talk to the networkers, of course, we are PGR students, so I'm going to talk about what uh, the networkers had 
mentioned, you know, in the Google document during the meeting, one of the things they said that if there are best practices, what are they? If not, can we create it? And here, I think I have to quote uh, uh, what Alison Donald, who's the head of um, LDC at UEA, in one of her published articles of, on decolonizing the discipline, she says something that, like this. One of the positive recognitions that comes with the move towards decolonizing is that we do not deliver this discipline. We create it and can therefore also recreate it. And building knowledge structures that are non-hierarchical and that value a range of different perspectives and communities is inherent to the success of our project. And one of the things that we have been doing at UEA and again, spearheaded by LDC was create a, a database uh, that has a whole lot of titles and resources from across the world dealing with a whole range of issues. In, I'm sure Arjang will be able to talk about it better. Another thing that uh, we discussed in, uh, with people randomly is assessment criteria, for example. We assess people using one particular criteria. That's most of the time in essay writing. But when I was teaching, I remember having students who were not able to deliver well uh, through essay writings. But if I were to judge them based on a presentation or any other form of uh, speaking, I'm sure they would have done extremely well. So these just two examples, but again, I'm a PGR and I have limited experience and knowledge and it's based on what I have, my conversations were. Okay, do you want to come back to, uh, on that, Amma, at all? What was the question? Sorry, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe respond to, to that or, or, or have any observations. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, it, that, I mean, the phrase best practices is, is, is so rooted and steep in whiteness. And, you know, I, I, I think we need to really, I mean, is there another phrase that we can use that captures what it is that we're trying, um, trying to say when we say best practices so that it's clear? Um, who's best practices and 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 how are, are best practices defined and who um, and who um, evaluates what these best practices are and you know um, and who and and and, and whom does it benefit, right? Um, so those are kinds of the kinds of things that I'm talking I'm, I'm thinking about and so this was very helpful to hear. So if any, anybody else has anything to add to it, I'd really appreciate that because it's such such a vague, vague phrase for me right now. It doesn't have any meaning. There, there's another example that was done by, again, uh, postgraduate researchers who are associate tutors, where they had created this sheet that, uh, just a, uh, an introductory sheet right before uh, they start the seminar, the very first seminar, where they would hand it out to students and they would be able to write their names, their chosen names and pronouns, any particular anxieties or triggers that their uh, seminar leader should know. And uh, when I spoke to the associate tutors who did that, one of the reasons they, they decided to go with that is because they didn't want to put students on the spot to ask them, what would you like to be called? Or, you know, what are your triggers? So and so. So this kind of information stays with the seminar leader. It also makes them feel that, you know, they are being listened to and uh, the seminar leader will be able to cater to their specific needs and uh, feedback. That's another thing that I've taken as an associate tutor, constant feedback to improve myself. And they felt that, again, I'm trying to make, you know, trying to make changes to my patterns according to um, what they want. Okay. Just some um, things from my experience, yeah. We're just going to move on to, I think we've got a question from Catherine, what have you, have you found? I've got, so we've got a, um, I think probably the next question um, came from Dave, who had a question about hiring practices. Dave Ellis, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I wonder if that question's maybe a bit too, too big uh, for this, because the, the presenter said that the level they were trying to be effective at wasn't the level at which they could affect hiring practices. It's possibly a bit unfair to bring that into discussion at this stage. But certainly the, the last question from Mama as well, it speaks so much to how we are steeped into a certain way of thinking and a certain way of being in higher education. And, I, and, and until we can change the way that we hire, we populate our sector, it's gonna be very difficult to, to achieve the decolonization we're aiming for. So maybe this is something for another time. You know, I think there's probably a whole seminar just on how we can work with progressing career routes 
through higher education in a way that's going to help us change uh, the nature that we work in. Yeah, I, I, sh I, sh I should also add that if, if you have questions um, and if you have responses to questions uh, that people have put in the chat, please do go ahead because this is being recorded. So this will be, re the chat will be captured as it were. So it's, it's worth not just waiting for your time to speak because we're, we're, that's limited, but also to put uh, points in, your, um, in, in the chat. I think there was one from Molly, um, Molly Medhurst. Um, Molly, are you online? I'll just unmute. Um, hello, sorry. Um, this is Alex uh, Eaglestone, who's part of the DDLDC working group. Me and Molly Medhurst are sharing a laptop to go to um, this conference. My question was, um, thank you to all the speakers so far for your presentations. My question is, how did you advertise and communicate your decolonizer discipline work to undergraduates? And what were some successful methods of communication? I'm happy to answer this one as part of our, our group. Uh, we, we, when we set up the group, we, we invited all of our undergraduate students. We simply emailed via our Blackboard. Um, we emailed all the students to come on board. And then as soon as we set up a Facebook group, the blog, and we also now have a team site, uh, it was up to our, our students to, to also further market uh, the group and, in, and invite everyone who wants to join. And since we've done this, we've, it's kind of exploded across the university where now we have people from different schools uh, and students joining the group. So yeah. just I think using your current channels of communication. Yeah, for us, it's also a word of mouth. Word of mouth works really well as well. Uh, um, uh, curriculum advisors actually were talking about their projects to different people and then they want to do uh, also then uh, join in. So now the next batch is actually coming through actually students themselves going out and saying oh we did this and come to the uh, panel and so on. Yeah so inviting them to pa uh, word of mouth is probably the best way you would actually capture the initial group which will actually participate in it and then once things get going then you'll have more of attraction to get others involved. Um, Asha, Freya, any, uh, any, uh, yeah, thanks. I mean, as I, I think I mentioned in our, in our, um, short talk, our focus this particular summer has been to work directly with our colleagues, but I do just want to kind of nod to the student stuff that is going on at Birmingham. And that just has an enormous reach, um, from students at UOB, but also to other universities. So I, I do think, you know, supporting our students is the most important thing we can do and the degree to which we can redirect um, resources that staff have access to including uh, staff time who might have kind of comms related roles uh, to support student-led initiatives you know that's that's my only kind of contribution on that point but yeah we've been focused with negotiating with our colleagues in the first instance. Thank you. Um, uh, we Question from Lara, um, and she if we've got probably got time to, at least for that. Yeah, I think we've got time for two because there's one from yeah. Hannah, which I would also like to. Yeah. Is this the one from Hannah that we're talking? No, we have one from Lara first. Lara and first, and then Hannah. Hannah. Yep. Yeah, okay. Hey. Oh, sorry. I was just typing it out because I didn't think I'd get time. So yeah, basically. Um, at UOB, I work in the decolonising science, and we um, we plan to run workshops across um, the southwest and um, across the UK. And one of the things that I'm noticing with the decolonising science UOB is that arts are now getting involved in, or have been involved in the conversation, but are more becoming involved. And how do we bring um, science and arts together so that it's like we're relying on each other and producing and relaying resources to each other? Because I feel like it should be a collective effort like separating it based on like schools and arts is I feel like really divisive and there's so that I've learned a lot more from arts well as much as from arts um, um, individuals than from um, my own individual because the research in science is sometimes can be limited so um, how important is that form of connections across um, like the whole of universities um, uh, departments Aishan in Syria, you've got an interdisciplinary network there, so yeah. how, how is that playing out there? We, we have an example, Arshan, do you want to 
we just had a message today from a faculty member from Health Sciences. Rajang, do you want to? Oh gosh, have I got that email yet? Sorry. Yeah, yeah it's it's on the you know the network chat. This. Uh, oh yes, of course. The so terminology. Like, yeah, of course. So so we had a message from Catherine. Uh, is it D is it Deacon? Is that right? Dean Dean Catherine. Dean. So Catherine Dean, who's who's um, who's worked with 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 us in various bodies uh, across the university, and she's raised the question of acronyms and labelling. Uh, and she's so I mean this is this is I think this is how effective the the network can be once it's been established because she raised that question from a health scientist point of view but then it expanded out uh, which Surya then grasped hold of and then included names you know in the network to see if we could you know if people would be willing to come along and, and talk about this so I think the the platforms you use I mean I think what you've got to bear in mind is that these are very uh, embryonic phases of development with these networks so I think one thing starts to take root a little bit more there'll be deeper connections between the different schools and disciplines across the university uh, Laura are you, are you are you at Bristol by the way is that right or yeah, yeah so you, we've had you yeah oh, we've you had you to talk to us didn't you um in the yeah. science department that's yeah, right really. and, <laughs> and so for example I wrote up your um your uh, speak your your talk sorry at UEA which had about 60 odd I mean I couldn't believe the attendance at your talk there were 60 odd people there and we were kind of envious in the arts that you got that many people to come to speak to, <laughs> to come to listen to you speak but once you'd spoken I was able to transcript with your help transcript the talk and put it up on the decolonized UEA society which was then another port of call for people mm -hmm. um, so we were very keen on sharing this idea of you know this is happening in lots of different disciplines and I know, I think it can be quite frustrating that the connections aren't quite there yet, but I think thing, through things like decolonized networks within the institution and then hopefully between institutions, mm -hmm. there'll be a greater way to be more transparent about this and a great way for people to comment you know, in different ways. But I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's very frustrating that it's all, it all feels slightly disembodied at the moment. Yeah. You know, but I'm hoping yeah. that in time and with this kind of, with this kind of initiative, for example, that we're doing today, that greater links can be made, you know. Thank you. Okay, I think I think we're we're, we're running a bit behind time. So what I'm going to do is uh, those uh, all the speakers. Uh, there was a very interesting um, question from Hannah Murray um, about uh, how you've dealt with negative responses from staff or mm -hmm. students to your initiatives. If the presenters could perhaps respond in the chat, um, and, and that obviously will give you uh, ample scope to, to to respond more fully, we can then move on to the next part of the uh, of the the session, which Catherine Baxter will chair. Um, uh, thank you, Catherine. It's over to you. Thanks, Anshu, and thanks everybody for that really fab first session. Um, so yeah, we're, we're moving on to the second session and the first person I'm going to introduce is Paulette Enneva. And Paulette's been teaching for 13 years and she works um, with secondary students in London and she's a founding member of the Decolonising the Curriculum for Educators group. Um, and she's going to be talking to us today with a, a paper, a sort of presentation that she's calling um, the importance of belonging, microaggressions and bias in the curriculum. So um, Paulette, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm really looking forward to this. Good afternoon, everyone. I actually feel quite nervous now. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, we, we're a group of teachers that have been um, long concerned about the lack of diversity within the curriculum, um, both as um, staff members and with our pupils um, what we believe is that the British education system has been has embedded historical foundations and structures within a white colonial lens which must be dismantled and disrupted for hundreds of years children have been part of an education system that has authored and de devalued the educational and academic experiences of the global majority um, I use the term global majority we, um, which was coined by Gus Johns, because we, we kind of feel that the, the, um, the government-led um, BAME um, title is, is quite disparaging in some, some aspects because it, it recognises some people and then forgets others. Um, and the collective people of the global majority, it's crucial for educators to work um, on the ground to be part of this process of change instead of the top-down approach, 
which counters the positionality of global majority teachers within the classroom. The brutal killing of, of George Floyd has sparked dia dialogue and a drive for change, which is crucial for moving forward. The dehumanization of the global majority is, re is revealed in plain daylight, um, oops, and plain daylight reflecting endemic societal injustice on all levels. Together with fellow educators, students, community activists, historic, historians, anti-racist organizations, and our white allies um, decolonizing the curriculum for educators, we're seeking to reflect on these powerful destructive processes in the curriculum that have become the norm. We want to forward a narrative for changing the curr curriculum to reflect the hidden global majority. Sorry, I've lost a bit. Sorry, I've lost a bit, not found it. <laughs> and to reveal the truthful historical accounts of those who built Britain and countries worldwide. Our stance is one of collective engagement, reflection and discussion about embedding the truth within a curriculum that has been fixed for a purpose. We forward strategies and insights on how to manage the first steps in decolonizing the curriculum, along with practical resources to move the discussion, discussion on towards active whole school staff and student engagement. Um, what we've been looking at and speaking about is the fact that as educators, we need to be able to start that difficult conversation um, as it relates to image of ourselves, um, our work progression and what we should and could be teaching. Our students are now beginning to, to question in where is their history and why when it is mentioned, only the negative appears to be, to mention, be mentioned. Why, why there are microaggressions that reinforce ne negative stereotypes of students and um, staff from the global majority. Um, these tend to, um, these include things like presuming that a black student is poor without, without um, asking and then acting surprised when such students or any black any student from the global majority is articulate oh wow you can speak it, it, these kind of things will, will debilitate a student they'll give them trauma they will stress them um they want they ask about positive images not just sports heroes and singers they want to know about the scientists the inventors the writers the architects that have, have built um, many different societies across the world and have influenced many, many European um, societies. Um, when it comes to, to teachers, educators are suffering. Um, they, they feel afraid to apply for higher roles because unless they've been okay by a white colleague, they don't feel as if they're good enough. They don't feel as if they're doing enough. Um, even though they, they might be working to the fullness of their ability, if they slip up for a day, they get asked, well, oh, you're not on your game today. What's going on? We want to try and get rid of those. We want to be able to, to for all staff and all students to be recognized, to have that conversation, um, to be able to say, you know, I'm here. We're here. And we've been here for a very long time. Um, what we've done, we've, we've had a conference um, where we, we had um, um, many attendees. Um, over 300 on Facebook and um, 200 via Zoom, um, which was in July. And those recordings are on our Facebook page if anyone wants to go back and see the panels that we've held. Um, and now we've put together some um, resources for teachers within schools, um, geography resources, um, primary resources, all, all across every curriculum um, area that we can think of that would need some input into how we can address what is lacking and what is missing. Um, we've also started to put together resources for educators themselves on how they can promote themselves and be stronger and more visible without it reverting to them being looked at as a stereotype. We want everyone to recognize that we're there and we want people to, to join with us and build the network so that we can all push forward that we're here, we're, we're, we're doing things, and we'd like people to recognise that. that. That's my presentation. Fantastic. How long have Thank I got? You, <laughs> have, you have more time. If you have plenty more time. <laughs> if you'd like to talk to us a bit more about anything, sort of maybe about um, what well, your experience has been and sort of, yeah, well, in, in terms of the it, network. It's been, um, it's been an eye-opener 
um, when you realise, and I think the killing of George Floyd, especially when you look at comments on Facebook and a lot of the social media, and you see the, um, the silent racism that's beginning to come out to the forefront, um, when you, you have um, leaders like um, the person in America that, that's espousing rate, um, race hate and um, hate language, and then you see the subtle racism that happens over in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, and people are now beginning to, to, to wake up. Not that they weren't awake before, but now we've got the opportunity to speak. And I think networks like these, the more we can reach out to people and give people guides and um, ways to look at different kinds of things um, will help us all to be, I think, stronger and a more of a force to be reckoned with, if not, even though I think we are, but we can be even stronger. Thanks. Thanks, Paulette. That, that's great. That's really interesting about the kind of the need for resources, like resources and guides and kind of practical support for people as well as kind of creating that network. Um, that's, that's super, thank you. I imagine we're gonna have a lot of questions and comments from people and um, sort of feedback and I hope so, hopefully we can come back to you or maybe kind of uh, okay. talk more about that if, that, if that's okay. No, but in the no meantime, way. great, thanks. So in the no meantime, one. let's move on to um, the next set of papers uh, or the next presentation rather. Um, this is from uh, colleagues at York um, their title, they've, they've given this the title Knowing Outside of English, Decolonization at York. And we're going to hear from Shazia Jagot, Jagot uh, uh, who's a lecturer in medieval and global literature at the University of York. And she's currently on research leave writing up her first monograph, which is on Chaucer's Arabic sources, and um, sources in quotation marks there. Um, and then Alexandra kingston Reese. She's a lecturer in contemporary literature at the University of York and is chair of admissions for English and externally the reviews editor. <laughs> so I'll hand over to Shazia and Alexandra. Thank you. Um, so I've just shared my screen so you should all be able to see that and you should all be able to hear me hopefully. Um, yeah, hear you. yeah, brilliant. Okay. Um, so um, hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, this presentation is going to explore some of the ways that Alexandra and I are approaching decolonizing um, the English and related literature degree at the University of York. Um, and we want to start by saying that we this really kind of seizes at the very beginning of setting up a decolonizing network. Um, and today we're really going to be drawing on some kind of very specific um, experiences so far that we've had so far, um, which we've kind of roughly divided into three contexts. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, our curriculum, we're going to talk about the institution um, and some of the, and then we're going to turn to a kind of more personal reflections as well. Um, and then the challenges that we face really in kind of trying to cohere discussions across the university um, and in ways that kind of ensure that decolonizing remains a form um, and a force of activism. Um, now, Alexandra and I stand at either end kind of, of the uh, department's period specialism, and we're really committed to ensuring that our decolonizing efforts work right through um, the long historical trajectory of our degree, which begins right with kind of with the classics so we're a degree that starts with classical civilization and ends up right in the contemporary um, world which um, is what Alexandra works in. So um, I'm going to start um, with our curriculum um, because we thought it would be useful to acknowledge at the beginning that our department takes a fluid approach to the discipline. Our degree programs are born um, interdisciplinary and born multilingual. The Department of English and Related Literature at York has historically valued translation as a core component of literary pedagogy, in part due to its history of absorbing literature modules um, and colleagues from foreign language departments um, at the university. Um, our wide ranging linguistic coverage too offers students opportunities to engage with select foreign literatures, either in translation or in the original language, um, and thinking comparatively across borders, uh, between borders is a crucial part of what we do. Um, so our curricula um, encourages a vibrant 
multicultural um, view of literature, both European and global, um, and our students get the chance to engage with questions of language and translation and cultural difference from the first term of their very first year right through to MA level study. So to give you some examples from our personal teaching practices, um, Shazia and I have really uh, led uh, kind of decolonizing efforts in our fields within our curriculum. Um, so uh, contemporary for me, um, and American literature for me, and medieval literature for Shazia. Um, and we've both been at the, at the forefront of ensuring core modules in first and second year uh, actually teach the pervasive effect of colonial attitudes in British literature. For example, um, the co-taught uh, first year module called Empires and Aftermaths, which I redesigned a couple of years ago, features weeks on modernist Peruvian and Chilean poetry uh, to ensure we contextualize colonialism and global literature as well. Um, and decolonizing the second year, 20th and 21st century America module uh, that I currently convene in second year has involved uh, rethinking American imperialism, not simply as the extension of cultural power, but also in terms of racist and colonialist attitudes towards Native American, um, uh, Chiganax, and, and, and Asian American um, populations in the US as well. So while there has been a really strong um, history in the department of individual decolonizing efforts in individual modules, until now we haven't had anything that works to join all of our individual efforts up. Um, so hence our new network uh, slash working group. Um, but as Shazia will talk about, a core challenge for us will be shifting that unconscious pedagogical and philosophical position into a conscious and active one, reorienting not only what we teach, but also how we teach and within what larger contexts. So this move then towards a, um, a conscious decolonizing pedagogy is starting to gain some attention across the university. Um, and while we're at the beginning of developing our own decolonizing network or, or working group, um, Alexandra and I have been involved in a number of decolonizing initiatives that have been organized across the university. Um, and our two of these have been organized and led by, by York Student, Students' Union. Um, the first was a pilot collaborative strategy called Students as Consultants, um, where students worked in partnership with academic staff um, to discuss their perspectives on learning and teaching, including diversity of content um, and unconscious bias. Um, and the second event um, was called uh, Decolonizing and Diversifying the Curriculum at York. Um, and this brought together students and staff in a kind of collaborative roundtable style discussion. Um, the most recent event that we had, um, which was a virtual event, um, and which was extraordinarily successful um, in engaging the broadest range of staff and student voices um, on, the su on the subject that I've seen so far at York, um, was a roundtable forum that was organized by the library. Um, and I saw um, on the Zoom chat that, it, just, just a moment ago, there was lots of talk about the library, so I think that's um, something that we could kind of talk about in the discussion a bit more. Um, but the library organised, a library at York organised a, um, a roundtable discussion on how to decolonise and di diversify their collection. Um, and the discussion really amplified the number of challenges we face. Um, importantly, um, but importantly, one of the, the main challenges is, is taking a holistic approach to decolonizing, um, which is kind of one of the main challenges that we face at York. Um, the other kind of challenges are around um, formations of collections. Um, so the library's main collection is formed by academic curricula, and of course um, it goes without saying that the formation of collections and the formations of disciplines go hand in hand, um, and is really essential for um, thinking about how we both begin to understand um, and undo the structures that underpin our discipline, um, but also decenter canons in our discipline, um, which I'm sure you're, you're all kind of on board with. Um, but here also the acquisition of primary material um, is kind of the biggest barrier that we face um, when we're thinking about the praxis of decolonization um, our discipline and, and across disciplines. Um, one of the more kind of intriguing insights that kind of Alexandra and I learned during this library um, roundtable was that, was that students from other disciplines wanted the library to buy more contemporary fiction, um, especially for fiction by black and ethnic minority writers um, 
and somebody raised that they wanted to read more Zadie Smith, for instance. Um, and and, they, and that students were seeing this as a route to decolonizing their learning, which also chimes with um, something else we've already heard um, today. Um, and Alexandra and I have kind of briefly discussed the kind of particular role that fiction kind of in all languages might play in the wider movie colonize outside of our discipline. And again, I think it's something that we could all kind of discuss together. Um, um, and the, the, the library event also brought to light how kind of fractured our approach to decolonizing is across the university. So there's a real lack of coherence um, around what we mean by decolonizing. Um, there's um, a kind of particular challenge that we face as a term becomes institutionalized um, and this kind of institutional slippage between decolonizing and internationalization, which is really quite dangerous, I think, and, and is kind of already happening. Um, again, how we might think, how we might kind of join up, how we have might create a kind of more coherent joined up way of thinking about decolonizing across the university not only in academic programs but across each space and service that we provide um, and then always to kind of keep in mind that decolonizing is an active political force um, and there's a quote from um, a wonderful text from um, Mignolo and Walsh on decolon decoloniality um, which describes it as a way of point um, a way and option standpoint analytic practice and praxis so um, in forming this network, um, Shazia and I have taken our cue from a really fantastic um, sort of pedagogical resource, actually, um, from Eugenio Zorowski, um, and a question, where do you know from? Um, so, so she uses this as, um, as part of an introductory exercise that illustrates the importance of attending conscientiously to the ways we relate to one another in the classroom as part of our pedagogical and political responsibilities. Um, she stresses how vital it is that settler scholars give serious thought to the ways in which um, even the most seemingly mundane academic structures and conventions can reproduce colonialist hierarchies of power um, and um, how those colonialist hierarchies of power then alienate students. Um, who then um, subsequently can end up feeling that the institution disregards their ways of knowing and being. So instead of uh, perpetuating an imperialism structured around a single model of intellectual engagement, the simple question offers students the opportunity to recenter their learning in, in their own ways of knowing and being, as well as a way for institutions to rethink their traditional hierarchies, canons and critical frameworks. But this question has been really influential for Shazi and, um, and I as well, um, <laughs> given we both kind of chafe against um, the kind of the British way of teaching of, um, of teaching English. So um, in case my accent hasn't given me away, I grew up in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is a bicultural nation um, and former British colony, even though we shiver at that in New Zealand. Uh, so crucially, Aotearoa isn't just somewhere um, I come from, it is where I know from. So my upbringing, my ways of reading and thinking all impact the way that I teach as I'm sure um, is the case for all of us. I was lucky to learn in classrooms where indigenous perspectives were actively privileged, surrounded by te reo Māori, one of the three official languages of Aotearoa. Um, I, should, I should say that this is by no means the standard across New Zealand, but I was very lucky that this formed a large part of my literary education. So moving um, to the UK to teach, to York to teach, brought home to me just how English literature is considered here. And while at York, we're lucky to be part of an international and diverse faculty, our challenge really is how we harness these different positions of knowing into one of decolonization. Um, so like um, Alexandra said, I also kind of find myself chasing, chafing, I should say, chief, uh, against Eng teaching English um, literature. Um, but unlike Alexandra, and you can kind of tell from my accent here, um, I have been formed by a British education, um, one that was kind of accessible to um, a British working class ethnic minority. Um, my own knowing from is slightly more complex. Um, I'm a British Muslim of Indian origin via Southern Africa, um, who grew up and learned um, from schools and universities in Leicester, which is the only city in the UK with no ethnic majority, um, and which was unsurprisingly the first city to enter a local lockdown over the summer. Um, all of these things kind of impact how I learned English literature, but it's also how, kind of in, 
kind of what's formed me as an academic um, and as a medievalist in particular, um, where both in my teaching and my research, I aim to try and move um, towards kind of denationalizing the study of medieval literature. Um, now, this is something that is kind of easier to do at York because the department has always valued um, teaching medieval literature in a non-nationalizing and multilingual framework. Um, and I've been able to kind of help shape this further by expanding the remit of uh, medieval beyond the boundaries of Europe. Um, and I do this in a second year module that's called um, The Shock of the New, um, where students read texts that were originally written in Latin in Anglo-Norman, um, texts written in Middle English, which they read in Middle English, um, and now um, also Arabic. Um, so across three weeks, students go from exploring texts and spaces in medieval York um, to looking at Chaucer in his wider European context, um, moving to, from Chaucer to, um, to 14th century Mamluk, Egypt. And so we kind of move from the local to the global without privileging England as the only space of importance in the medieval period. Um, and this is not just a case of diversifying the curriculum by kind of throwing in a non-European text, um, which as we know is often the way that kind of um, labels something as being kind of decolonized, um, but a move towards, um, and one that is still in motion, carefully constructing and embedding texts places and histories that have not only been marginalized um, but almost completely absent um, in the teaching broadly speaking of medieval literature in the UK. So locating ourselves um, and where we know from um, chimes with the stance that um, Mignolo and Walsh express in their work on the decolonial uh, decoloniality, <laughs> uh, where they emphasize, um, emphasize the, um, the real importance of recognizing and understanding the decolonial four. Um, so just to um, briefly read out this quote, how those who live the uh, colonial difference think theory, theorize, practice, and build, create, and enact concrete processes, struggles, and practices of resurgent and insurgent action and thought, including um, um, in the spheres of knowledge, territory, land, state, re-existences um, and life itself. And on the other hand, the question is how this praxis interrupts and cracks the modern clo um, colonial capitalist um, heteropolitical uh, matrices of power and advances other ways of being, thinking, knowing, theorizing, feeling, acting and living for us all, the otherwise um, that is the decolonial four. So it's these fours and these froms that are really motivating um, Alexandra and I as we kind of um, decide to uh, get on with our decolonizing network and set one up, um, working in the space of, of adding to of the generative, uh, the reparative um, of, uh, and another quote from um, Walsh and Mignolo here, affirmation and reaffirmation that disrupt and unsettle coloniality's negations um, in Walsh's phrasing that kind of take us beyond an anti-stance. Um, so Alexandra and I really want to do more than just undo what we know, but to show how decoloniality can sh kind of really sh reshape how we know. Um, and we hope to try and do this um, in, the, in, the, in the degree that we teach in at, at, um, at York in English and Related Literature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. That was fantastic. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, so we have one more uh, presentation this afternoon. Uh, this is from colleagues um, at Lancaster University. We're joined by Fabiha Skari, who's co-chair of the Why Is My Curriculum White Decolonization Campaign at Lancaster, and by Liz Oakley-Brown, who's senior lecturer in pre-modern writing in the Department of English Literature and, Liter and Creative Writing at Lancaster. So I'll hand over to Fabiha and uh, Liz. Thank you very much. And I'm just trying to share my screen. Can you see it? Not yet. No. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Um, let's try again. Something has happened. It had to be the last talk, didn't it? That uh, ever the professional. Let's just try that. Is that yeah, working? Yes. Yeah, it's working. Good, good. And we can, can hear you too. So. Really, I'm glad about that. Thank you. Can I just check that we can hear Fabia? Fabia, would you like to say hi? Hello, hi. Great, right, thank you. Yeah. Because yeah. thank you. This is mostly going to be uh, about you and your work. So. Um, 
for me, one of the best things about 2019-20 strike action was the teach outs which brought our universities, communities in off campus spaces uh, together. And I returned to the HEI workspace changed by the collective energies of those teach outs. And it was at those teach outs that I came across um, talks by the um, Lancaster University's Why Is My Curriculum White campaign. And most of what we have to say this afternoon is actually going to be about the report that we received from the campaign um, back in the summer. So just to give you a bit of context about my own department. Um, so I'm from a department, English Literature and Creative Writing, um, where, where we, we sort of reforeground critical and creative practices. And we have, I suppose, the standard um, committees um, which are devoted to um, the very important process of decolonization of our curriculum. Uh, we have a departmental EDI committee that was established in 2019. Um, which includes uh, thinking about decolonisation alongside the awaited race equality charter, at least is awaited at Lancaster, and that includes undergraduates and postgraduate students. In the wider campaign, and I'm just working back from the date of July 2020 when we received the, the, um, the report that Fabia is going to talk about, um, we also um, were embedded in um, a faculty um, network which was originally called Decolonising the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, that that um, network really also um, took a lot of force and impetus from the strike, the strike, uh, the period of strike action, where we actually had the time to meet and talk together across across the faculty. And that's now just be, be renamed as Decolonising Lancaster. So um, I want to go back then to I mean, bring in Fabia because I think the amount of, of work that has gone into this report is incredible. I think it should be broadly known. And Fabia, are you waiting to come in now to, to talk about your report and the campaign? Yeah, thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, it's an honour to have been invited to speak to you all today, and it's really lovely being here. So thank you so much for having me. I'm a second year history and politics undergraduate student at Lancaster and also one of the co-heads of the Wise My Curriculum White campaign. Today, I'll be introducing this campaign to you, very briefly discussing the findings of a report we published a few months ago, and also providing some suggestions for what can be done to continue our efforts in decolonizing. This campaign was initially founded in 2016 by Sophia Kell, who is now a leading expert on race inequality, and it was created with the intention of being independent and student-led. We have continued with these principles in mind and are therefore still not affiliated in any way with the university or with the students union. Some of our aims include lobbying the university and the union to decolonize both academic disciplines and general university life too, to put pressure on the union and the uni to actively address the very prevalent issue of racism present there and to ensure that their commitment to this is genuine and effective. In general, therefore, we hope that by educating and campaigning, we can bring about a real change on campus by bringing the current inequalities present at our institution to light, but also through providing a range of solutions to bring long-term social and sy systemic change. So far, we've been successful in establishing relationships with different departments, but admittedly, the most developed relationships we have have been confined to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, and this is actually the first year that um, we've got a um, person in the committee who is from the um, English Literature Department. So that, yeah, it's really fantastic um, that we're kind of expanding. But this year, as co-head of the campaign, I have committed to, the ex um, to extending these relationships beyond the fa this faculty. Um, for example, by involving members of other faculties in their campaign's executive committee, which has just been established. This will hopefully broaden our understanding of how different faculties are introducing decolonization in their own principles, in their own disciplines. 
uh, by attending and participating in discussions, debates, and panel events such as such as this, both at Lancaster University and at other universities, we have further enriched our understanding of what it means to decolonize and how we can go about doing this. However, one of our most significant successes has been a report we recently published named Built in Barriers, which focuses um, on the role of race in shaping the experiences of BAME students at Lancaster Uni. There's hopefully on this slide um, going to be a QR code um, as well as a link. So if any of you would like to access um, that report and some of our other uh, projects and social media accounts, then you can uh, please feel free to access those. Um, so essentially the report was produced by Uxa Emmett and Darius Barucha, who were the last leads of the campaign, and they volunteered over a hundred hours of their own time to research and write up this report without the help of the student union or any of the senior management. The report surveyed 140 students and its purpose was to identify the key issues faced by BAME students at Lancaster Uni and present suggestions to the uni on how to work towards becoming a truly anti-racist institution, which we're not currently convinced it is. Some key data from the report reveals that 65% of BAME students feel that their course content is Eurocentric. One student who was surveyed stated that they felt reluctant when speaking in academic settings as they claimed that they did not want to feed into the narrative of being a quote, angry woman of colour. And it is unsurprising therefore that our report found that 47% of all students who participated felt that they had to modify their cultural and or ethnic identity in order to fit into the Western academic setting, which is perpetuated uh, by our institution. The report also found that 20% of those surveyed felt excluded from, from formal academic settings because of their race, yet also noted that this feeling of exclusion was not limited to Lancaster, but echoed throughout institutions in the UK. One BAME student stated that they have uh, had, lecture, had lecturers use uncomfortable terms to discuss minorities, and another student um, who participated in the survey um, reflected on a particular incident in which they felt that Eurocentric stereotypes were further propagated by their lecturer. This may be a result of sheer ignorance or lack of understanding regarding the impact of language and choice of terminology on BAME students. However, the consequences of unconsciously addressing topics without being sensitive with the language one uses are severe and can therefore propagate feelings of exclusion. Therefore, one of our key suggestions from this report is to address and reflect upon the language that is used in academic spaces. The recommendations provided by the report are perhaps one of its most significant features, as they suggest ways in which the BAME student experience at Lancaster could improve. These recommendations were separated into four main categories, which were representation, racism and racial microaggression, reporting racism, and lastly, the BAME awarding gap. Some of our suggestions included making decolonization a priority for all curriculum audits, including the topic of representation as a feature of module feedback, the active creation of anti-racist learning spaces with, as mentioned before, a specific focus on addressing the language used in these spaces, sufficient race equality training, educating staff on the BAME awarding gap, and encouraging the use of anonymous marking. I strongly believe that academics are in a leading position to support and empower students to join such discussions, promote research, and reflect on their own ways of teaching, and ultimately inspire change. Decolonization should not be used as a tokenistic tool or a tick box exercise. Instead, as Mia Leon Leonage argues in her paper, decolonization should reassert academic rigor by introducing new and challenging perspectives and ask pedagogical questions which she claims are chronically under addressed. Furthermore, whilst I can understand the great intentions behind why academics often want to involve BAME students within the process of decolonizing their departments, it is incredibly important to not assume the willingness of these BAME students in participating in such conversations. The emotional toll of this on BAME students who often have to revisit trauma cannot be ignored. 
Instead, the option to discuss such matters should be encouraged and every department should ensure that the topic of decolonization is at the core of their discussions and not exclusive to BAME students, but can and should be accessed um, and discussed by all students. It's incredibly dangerous to limit discussions of decolonization to the BAME community as it further perpetuates the idea of otherness, which is exactly the opposite of what such conversations should be doing. Efforts to decolonize departments need to be inclusive of all staff members and students, regardless of race, and only then will departments truly be effective in their goal to decolonize. I'm personally very lucky to have been encouraged and empowered to speak up about such issues, but I would like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that most BAME students don't actually get the same opportunities. For many students, the very structures that claim to represent and liberate them serve only further to silence them. Others are only encouraged to speak up during certain days or months, such as Black History Month, but are ignored for the rest of the year. Decolonization must not be used as a patch to cover and thus substitute random parts of the curriculum, but should be intentionally embroidered within the very fabric of each curriculum. As no institution has thus far been completely successful in decolonizing, it is understandable that working without a template or example is most definitely difficult. However, this process is not meant to be a simple one. It is one that is strenuous and requires both learning and unlearning. Unlearning concepts that feel so natural and comfortable is undeniably challenging, but I hope that we can all agree that it is essential. Furthermore, it is undeniable that along the way we will make and may have already made some mistakes, but this is not something that should make us conclude our efforts. Rather, it should further inspire us to keep learning with the knowledge that, that success in this practice is not linear. Our student-led campaign at university, for example, has had its successes, but this has not been without having to face many difficulties and obstacles along the way. Not only have these been physical obstacles of acquiring space and holding events, for example, but also mental and emotional challenges, as students and academics have questioned the necessity and purpose of the very existence of our campaign. Change requires dedication and persistence, and that is perhaps one of the most important lessons our campaign has learned. Rather than ignoring or getting frustrated at people who disagree with us, we now put our time to engage in discussions with them in the hope that they can realise that any critical evaluation of our actions is always welcome, and that our campaign is not exclusive, but welcomes and encourages the involvement of everyone. I therefore strongly believe that real systemic change is wholly dependent upon the collective effort of all students and staff members, both within and beyond the BAME community. Many people still remain uncertain or unaware of why decolonization is important and how it can greatly benefit academic disciplines. Therefore, our first objective should always be to educate our peers on the necessity of this process and the positive impact it has the potential of having on all student and staff members irrespective of race. Overall, I would like to conclude that from my experiences so far, what I have gathered is that the most important thing academics of any department can do for its students is simply to listen. Students are more willing to get involved in such discussions than one may initially assume, but for this, an open, accessible and welcoming environment is necessary. Discussions between academics and students regarding this matter are priceless and must be the foundation of all decolonization movements at any institution. It is simply not enough to state that universities understand the meaning of decolonization and support it as a concept. It is time to actively implement changes and ensure that the topic of decolonization does not simply dissolve into becoming a moment, but instead blossoms into a movement. Thank you so much for listening and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both to Liz and Fabia. That was, um, yeah, really fantastic. Really fantastic to hear about. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in already. And um, yeah, so I don't know, Anshu, have you been able to keep track of of where, we're, where we are with those things and can help me kind of navigate who we should turn to first for questions. I'm going to unmute you because I think you're muted at the moment. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so I was um, uh, 
we, we had a very important question about, about the question of, uh, of, of this uh, English literature. Uh, I'm just trying to find it, um, about the term English and the language issue that, is, uh, that arises from that. Oh, yes, yes. It's, from, it's from Patricia Malone. Patricia, do you want to, to voice this? Uh, hello, is that me? Yes, you, we can hear you. Hi, yes. um, okay, I was just asking about the framework of this, which uh, is a very difficult one in terms of the idea of um, English literature, like I'm at Edinburgh, where we immediately begin with, you know, some people take an English lit degree, some people take a Scottish lit degree, um, but English lit, as everyone's noticed in the comments there, subsumes so much into it. Um, uh, and also fails to capture the diversity of languages that are um, reflected in, in even, I'm not very comfortable with the term British, but um, in what we might call British writing as well. Um, and I'm wondering, partly this is for me as well, looking for like, you know, advice or suggestions on how we reframe this. I've tried using Anglophone more recently um, but, but I don't know if that's the right term. Um, and I, I, this is connected to, to the idea that when we teach, you know, um, the comment on post-colonial literatures, like the very, the way in which, um, you know, national specializations in literature reinforce um, those imaginary borders that sort of um, perpetuate differentiation on, um, you know, nationalistic, uh, racialized terms quite often. Um, we had a response to you from Vi. Um, I wonder if Vi, if you want to just elaborate on your response in the chat. Yes, hi. Uh, uh, it's, I was just saying that as long as we have a category called post-colonial literature or in, uh, English uh, literature in English, we are going to have this uh, debate about what is English literature and uh, is, is the labelling of it then complicates the very aspect. So uh, we discuss things like uh, where would Salman Rushdie sit? Uh, where would uh, Zadie Smith sit? And um, so how, how are we categorising this? So it is, a, it is a really complex issue and I think it's still there is this drive to think about, uh, I'm sure you're aware Michael Gore was trying to create this canon. The canon was, has to be British English literature. And it kind of went backwards in a number of ways. So we are still struggling with this idea of English literature really. There was also a, a, a parallel conversation about translation. I don't know if it ever crystallised into a question, but it involved Greg Walker and uh, Shazia and, um, and Claire Lees. I, I wonder if you might, one or all three of you might want to speak to that? I'm happy to um, jump in and try and pose a question. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's a reflection that comes out of Shazia's presentation and thanks very much for that. Um, um, both of the presenters from York were really interested. Um, but there is a, an issue here about um, how English is the language, is the medium uh, into which um, we trans um, uh, uh, other literatures and other languages are translated. Um, and this is um, not exclusive to uh, medieval literature though I think and I think Shazi is doing really important work to to um, decenter it but the, but uh, by the same token um, Arabic medieval Arabic uh, medieval French medieval Italian are being taught in other areas within university within the university uh, departments and I wonder um, how we negotiate teaching, and translating into English, um, the question of the multiple languages um, uh, of literary study. Let's put it that way. I can, um, so I can give a quick kind of response to that in terms of what we do at York, um, where actually we run a series of modules that are called World Literature Modules, where students actually read the text. They learn 
they 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 have workshops alongside um, seminars where they're learning the language of the text that they're reading. So we um, one of my colleagues is a Dante scholar, so he teaches um, Italian um, in workshops, and then they read um, Dante in Italian with some English kind of English English is there as the medium, as the kind of scaffolding, as it were, um, so that. And, and that in that way they're then getting kind of that, that language they're getting some immersion into language um and and being able to access the literature in um in its original form um it's, it's more difficult with arabic because it's such a it's such a difficult language so i can only read get them through um, the alphabet, but we, 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 you know, we focus on it as medium language, as a language that, that, that allows them to access the material um, and, and thinking of it as the kind of first step almost into that access into material. And we talk about the issues around translation and what's at stake in translation as well. Um, but we run a whole kind of suite of these different modules um, in different, with different languages. So one of my colleagues does something in Spanish and, um, and um, yeah, so uh, that's what we do at York, but there are, yeah, lo lots of... Um, Can I come back in and just pose yeah. as, as a question to, to everybody or as a larger question, because it isn't just unique to, to, to the situation at York. Um, there's an, can, what, how, I'd love to hear people reflect on um, the assumption that all our students' first language is English. Oh, there you go. <laughs> comment in the in the box. I I was going to I was going to ask actually, Shazia, do you? I mean, so one of the challenges then is that we're often still working in the languages that get taught already, um, while actually people may well have their have be bilingual or multilingual with languages that aren't taught in in kind of British curricula on the whole. Um, do you work with students who have Arabic as well or kind of who, I mean, are there, is that something you're finding in York where people are saying, can we work with these languages, not necessarily the kind of traditional European languages that I think have been the background in York on, in, in the past anyway? Yeah. Well, I've only been at York for a year, so um, this has only been my, my first year at York with this kind of experience um, and I have taught um, I have, I have taught students who come from um, countries um, where Arabic is um, their main language um, and um, and yeah and are excited and I've chosen that module because um, they, they can do literature that they haven't um, been able to do before or are able to have a kind of connection to a particular text or, or, or um, because it was written in that language. I don't know um, I don't know what discussions have been had in the past in the department over what other languages students might want, um, but but there is certainly an, a broader issue around um, what languages are taught, um, and I also say that from a personal perspective, somebody who, who is, comes from a bilingual background, uh, whose language you know I, I speak a small kind of di Indian dialect that would never be taught anywhere um, on, on a British curriculum. So that that. But yeah, there's the, the broader questions there about structures of language and, and what's being taught um, across educate, British education. I don't know if that answers your question though, Catherine. Uh, Catherine, can I just come in here um, on this um, as well? So we have, um, um, I know <laughs> she will not appreciate me name dropping her here, but we do have a, um, a colleague who who runs um, a third year specialist module called Found in Translation, which allows students who do have that other language, well, any other language, they don't need to be fluent in that language, to, um, to undertake um, a suite of um, sort of translation exercises. So what they submit is not an essay, uh, written in English, it, it is a translation. Um, and so that's an opportunity for students who do um, who do speak other languages, who are bi bilingual or multilingual, um, do like Dr. Nicoletta Oshito, um, is uh, to actually take a module which allows them to read in that language, um, in whichever language it is, and to work with that language. So 
I mean, obviously we do need <laughs> multilingual scholars to help us actually set um, those, those modules and assess them um, and so on and so forth, because there are challenges around that, especially if, you know, the major language that we teach in is, is, is English in this country. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to plug that because that's one wonderful way in which we've um, sort of, yeah, started to think about that in a curriculum sense. So Thanks we've got, Andrew. yeah, Anshu, have we, because we're, yeah, we're well, actually, the, 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 the key questions. There's a question, there's a question from me earlier on, and the, uh, I, I think there's two key questions, uh, Le, uh, two actual questions in the chat. Uh, one is actually from me, um, and it's to Fabia, and I was really interested by the report, which seemed like a really powerful form of intervention, but I did also note that it took over 100 hours of the author's time, unpaid. Um, now, as a department or as an institution, we could rectify that, we could resource it. Um, but that would mean compromising your independence, which at the, at the start you, you, you made you know, clear was a very conscious choice. So do you think that that unpaid labour was the price you sort of have, have to pay? Or is there another way? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your question. I, I think it's a really interesting um, one, especially in the context of Lancaster and kind of the pressure that we've previously put on to both the university and the union to uh, carry out research and do certain things. I think it was kind of the only option uh, for Lux and Darius um, at that time. Um, I think they did try to get some sort of funding uh, or other resources, but they weren't too successful. Uh, we did get kind of, you know, some just support, general support from uh, lecturers and academics, but I think it was quite difficult to um, get any sort of, um, I guess, um, paid support. Um, in our report, actually, what we've concluded in the recommendations is that the, you know, university and the union both actually carry out some research themselves because the amount of resources and they have is n nothing that we can kind of compare to, and I think they would um, most definitely be able to. Um, carry out more um, significant and um, detailed research. It is difficult though because the point of independence, I think a lot of people right now, um, especially with the student union, perhaps don't connect, feel like they connect to it and I don't know how genuine the responses to that re to, to those surveys um, would be. So it's a, it's a difficult question but I think having the university and the union involved in any sort of research um, is something we would absolutely kind of um, campaign for and kind of love for them to do um, and I think this was more of a kind of um, situation where we didn't really have much of an option to do anything else uh, but I, I hope that kind of other universities and other departments can kind of resource uh, their students and I, I'd really recommend doing that to be honest because um, there was so much work that they did and you know it's in their third year as well so they've both graduated now which uh, is uh, yeah fantastic but um, yeah thank you. Okay thank you uh, thank you Fabia that's uh, that's really it was a great presentation thank you. Um, I, I've got a question here from Tom Harrison um, Tom, would you like to voice it or would you just like me to read it out? Oh, yeah, I can have a go <laughs> at verbalising. Um, yeah, the, the question was just about, uh, or I suppose it was more a reflection, that translation, working with translations is always, um, always a, a potentially difficult um, uh, process because it obscures just as much as it reveals by turning... Uh, a source text from an original language into into English and sometimes there are updates, uh, contemporizations, um, even omissions. I work with uh, uh, Latin text quite a bit and old translations just cut bits out that aren't seen as particularly uh, seemly anymore um, in, in sort of 19th century editions. So yeah, the question was just what what is what is uh, the position from people who are multilingual on using translations and what sort of uh, issues have they come across? I, th I think Vedrana in the chat um, uh, offered a, a, a response, but maybe you could elaborate. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question, Tom. 
Uh, well, I guess it comes back to the the issue that uh, Shazia and Alexandra mentioned in, in their presentation by, by citing Eugenia Zurovsky, where do you know from? So I suppose for me, coming from kind of post-communist Yugoslavia, where, where I was born in Eastern Europe, I, and teaching an, an English degree, uh, I always made sure to in, incorporate texts in translation, particularly from, from that part of the world. So, um, and again, there's a whole question of, you know, as, as you mentioned, Anglocentrism, but also how these texts are, are marketed and, and read. So I think for me, one way in terms of decolonizing uh, is to maybe show the students how, for example, I'll show, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a, a, a collection of essays by a post Yugoslav writer, Dubravka Ugrosic, it's called Nobody's Home. But I'm, 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 I want you to see that the book cover, because the, the collection of essays is about homelessness and post-communist experience, but what it shows here is this couple who, who seem quite at odds with, you know, what people from Eastern Europe look like. I mean, the, this young man then traces off a kind of Dracula image, I mean, if you can see the kind of the sunken face and all of that. And, you know, there has been a lot of, of essays on a kind of Dracula as, you know, a kind of a post-colonial subject, especially in Bram Stoker. So, and again, the, the, the young woman who wears a headscarf here is also another example. Uh, I mean, from in my part of the world, maybe you can still see some, some women in, in Bosnia with, with headscarves, but um, younger women probably not. So I think that's, that's the example of how you can, I suppose, challenge some of those um, structures, I suppose, and ways of reading when it comes to translation and marketing and teaching okay. of those texts. Thank you. I don't think we've got anything else, Catherine, on the, in terms of questions in the chat. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so in that case, I'm going to hand over to Nicole Kling, um, who's going to say a few words to kind of wrap everything up. But thank you, everybody, for your fantastic presentations in the second half as well. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. I know some people have to get going. We're running a little bit late. I'm not going to take a lot of time because um, the eloquence, we've had the eloquence in these presentations. I just want to say my headline is I'm actually looking forward to my next um, sort of admin senior, senior management team meeting, uh, not, you know, that I have to attend for some reason so that I can, when somebody says BAME this or BAME that, I can say, do you mean the global majority students, or do you mean the global majority staff? So thank you, Paula, because I've been looking or wanting a much better word than, than BAME. It's, it's so inadequate in many ways. Um, and I really appreciated Paulette's um, presentation. I was going to go in order, but I won't go in order, um, not least for helping us to just get a sense of what's going on um, across sectors, um, uh, not just higher education, where the majority of our presentations were, were, were drawn from, um, but to think about all of, that, all of that activity, because of course I, I, I teach in higher ed, um, and where our students are coming from and the activism of, of their teachers like, like Paulette um, and the network that she's created, I think is really important for us to be aware of. Um, and I do think that the, the, the thread um, the, the inspiring thread through all of these presentations were uh, encouraging us uh, uh, to work with our students as partners. Um, it, very interesting uh, dilemma or debate around, you know, paying them um, as some of uh, some of you do uh, for, for the students' time, but also um, the, the sort of independence perhaps when, when students are working outside of specific university structures as a way of inter-, inter um, uh, intervening uh, in, and, and changing uh, existing structures. But certainly from Arzang and Surya's uh, opening talk, one of the things um, that I think came through um, and was carried through in the other presentations um, was not just the uh, benefits of interdisciplinarity, um, but also the necessity for transparency and trust uh, as we are working with one another, whether we're working across departments, across 
um, areas of university or across uh, positions of relative power and lack of power, um, transparency and trust. Um, I also really appreciated the practical sorts of information that the presenters gave us. So for instance, um, in Asha and Faria's uh, 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 presentation on establishing a decolonizing network at Birmingham. The fact that just to say that they successfully used the SOAS toolkit um, was 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 great, right? You know that th that was a starting point. I don't know if it was a starting point, but that it but that you it's there. Here's a resource for all of us, but also that they successfully used it. Um, um, so thank you, uh, thank you for that. But also I. I the idea of activating an alumni network um, and giving giving alumni not just saying because I think we all are now in that mode of you know we've got to keep in touch with the alumni but giving them something very specific to become involved with I think is an, a, a fantastic um, idea and of course Vi and Vedrana and Rebecca thank you so much Rebecca um, it was it, also really inspiring to hear from from students today um, that idea of giving students ownership over over this work, um, um, uh, and of course it was at uh, at Brighton where they paid their students uh, for their work, um, and I think that idea that I, I, we do need to be reminded, right, that the burden for this work cannot fall on the shoulders of students of color, um, in the same way that the burden can't fall upon the shoulders of of <laughs> the very minuscule numbers of staff. Uh, 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 from the global majority who are who are in in the institutions that we're interested in decolonizing this this collective work um, there was one other thing one or two other things oh as a phrase so in addition to thinking about the global majority um, conscious decolonizing pedagogy that's fantastic that was from Alexandra and Shazia um, and I put something in the chat about a year long lecture series that I'm actually involved in full disclosure um, at the University of Maryland and their first um, their first speaker and you can see her 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 talk they're recording all of their talks they're all free was in fact Eugenia Eugenia Zorowski um, and uh, talking about where do you know from so that link is in the chat if anybody wants that. So yes, listening to our students working together cross in a cross-disciplinary way, um, thinking about the language we use and how, uh, obviously this is the work that we do as, as, as students of, of, of literature is, is thinking about the power um, of language, how it can be empowering and disempowering. Um, I, I, I think this is a wonderful way to launch um, to launch this network and I just want to say again thank you to all of you all of the presenters for sharing with us the methodologies the hiccups the successes um, that you have encountered and are encountering in your own localized efforts thank you thanks Nicole thanks everybody for coming along um, I put a link in the um, chat uh, where you can reach our web pages if you haven't already joined the network. We'd love you to join and we'll be kind of hoping to do more events like this in the future. So yeah, keep in touch. Thank you again, everyone. Really great. Really, really enjoyable and so much to ponder and think on. It's been, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all our speakers as well for giving of their time and for Absolutely. such great presentations. Thank you. Uh, Becky, um, do you do you know where how um, the recording could be accessed by people? Yes, um, so uh, I can um, upload it to the English Association YouTube channel and just pop around a link. That's probably the easiest way. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, and we'll link to it from our web pages then as well. That's great. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Bye.